You're listening to the Yoga Medicine Podcast. I'm your host, Tiffany Cruikshank. Our podcast brings you information and resources to enhance the therapeutic effects of your practice based on a deeper understanding of anatomy, physiology, and the integration of modern science and research with traditional practices and experiences. Join me and my co-hosts, Rachel Land and Katya Barch, as we dive into all things yoga, research, and wellness. The content of this podcast is not medical advice and is not meant to replace medical care. Please consult your healthcare provider to determine what is best for your unique healthcare needs. All right. Welcome back. I am really excited. We love, we love nerding out on the fascia. We're going to talk about the fascia and the autonomic nervous system today, which really, I feel like I was joking to Katya earlier because I was like, I feel like it's really just one big sales pitch for myofascial release and why you should do it. <laughs> so those of you who love myofascial release, those of you who use it with your students, this will be a nice, a nice um, support to the information you're giving people of why you're using it and how you're using it and maybe adding some more reasons to do myofascial re release. And if you practice with us online, there's tons of resources on there for you to practice with and explore and find what's helpful for you. But I think you'll find some really interesting insights in this episode as we dig into fascia and the autonomic nervous system. So let's start off with that. Katya, why don't you, you want to talk a little about just a quick intro to what is the autonomic nervous system before we, before we go deeper? <laughs> yeah, let's do that to, to really dive in, in there. Um, so the autonomic nervous system, you may have heard already, is part of the peripheral nervous system. So that's opposed to your central nervous system, which consists of the brain and the spinal cord. And your peripheral nervous system then can be further divided and the uh, autonomic nervous system or autonomous nervous system is um, controlling our involuntary movements, we say. So like your bowel movements, your breath, and that's again opposed to the voluntary movements like your muscle movements. And typically um, we say that the autonomic nervous system consists of the parasympathetic nervous system, which is like a big star in the yoga realm. That's the part of your nervous system that kind of controls or, or regulates your rest and digest um, part. So whenever your belly is gurgling in Shavasana after you did yoga, that's probably your parasympathetic nervous system speaking as it regulates your digestion. And then we have the sympathetic nervous system, which typically is set to govern the fight and flight response. So when you have stress, that's probably um, a high tone of sympathetic tone to be found. And then we also, and that's a little bit newer, but it's also been established for a couple of years. We also would say the enteric nervous system belongs to that. So your belly brain that has a life of its own, which we have known now for a while and which is really fascinating as well. So those three parts would make up the autonomic nervous system. So now that we understand the, the basics of it, which I think is pretty familiar now, especially to yoga teachers and, and um, a lot of people in the health and wellness space. But next, let's talk about how the fascia is connected to the autonomic nervous system. This is where it gets really interesting. And there's a lot of new research on this in the past decade or so. So there's a lot of new fun insights, I think, to, to chat on. Um, I'll let you decide where you want to begin. <laughs> yeah, I heading into this conversation, I really want to say that um, what we're about to discuss to me when I first learned about this was really, really mind blowing. So as a body and nervous system nerd, this connection that we're talking about today really filled in a lot of blanks, or at least um, in my head made a lot of the connections for topics that I had learned about the body yeah. and what we do with the body and then the nervous system and how they really connect so that it made sense and not on an esoteric level, but an actual connection. So to me, what we're discussing today is really um, something that has the potential to, to be mind blowing because it explains so much of what we do as either body workers or yoga teachers or actually any, any kind of movement professionals. I agree. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> yeah. And I do also think to, to kick off this conversation, I want to throw in a quote by 
um, a professor that has been very influential or has been an important figure in the career of Dr. Robert Schleip, who we had here on the show. Um, he's called Professor Staubesand, and he said something that couldn't be couldn't be worded better because he said any intervention on the fascia is also an intervention on the autonomic nervous system, and I think that's we could actually if we didn't want to go into the specifics, we could stop the conversation now because it's something that's really essential to our conversation today. If you do work on or with your fascia, you are going to influence that autonomic nervous system. So you are going to influence your stress response or your relaxation response. You are definitely making the two talk. And that's kind of the the starting point or the <laughs> hypothesis that we will yeah, carry through the whole conversation today. I feel like that's like a microphone drop there. We haven't even gotten into the details. And I love that you had the, at the beginning because it kind of plants the, the seeds where we're to go. It's like the, it's the social media post. We got we to gotta get that one out there, right? So that I feel like it's a great just introduction to, to where we're going. Yeah, and I think what we what we will we'll, we'll discuss today are a bit more the specifics of that or the details of that. So the fascial system is really connected through different pathways, if you wish, um, to the autonomic nervous system. So your um, sensory receptors, your mechanoreceptors that we have discussed in, in a prior episode on here, if you're not familiar with that concept, those are going to be one pathway sort of that connects the fascial system to the autonomic nervous system, then the types of autonomic nerves themselves that run into the tissues are going to explain some of the effects that we can see when working on or with the fascia. And then also we're going to talk a little bit about some neurotransmitters or cytokines and how they may communicate or um, be related to the fascial system. So that's kind of what we would like to cover today. And I'll just plant a little seed there for what you just said. And that I think that was in the episode called Fascia as a Sensory Organ that we did. If you want to dig deeper into that, that's actually a good precursor to this episode. So you might even just pause if you haven't heard that one and go back. But keep in mind these mechanoreceptors she's talking about are a type of sensory nerve. Um, and so, and we'll talk to that as we go. Yeah, I would actually, why, why don't we start right there? And I do distinctly remember that when we had that episode or when we uh, recorded that episode, we, we bookmarked today's episode back then already. And yeah. he said, ooh, <laughs> some, of those, some of those mechanoreceptors, the Ruffini endings to be specific, um, they also are not only telling our bodies where they are in space, or they do not only respond to certain mechanical inputs, but they also do talk to the nervous system, to the autonomic nervous system that is. So that's kind of a good starting point to kind of yeah. go back to that reference that we had back then. And I, I think um, anyone who's done our, our any like MFR trainings with us has heard a lot about the Ruffini endings because that's a big one for body workers or MFR. But I also just wanted to place a mention too, just as a kind of laying the groundwork kind of thing. And I think we mentioned this in the episode as, as on sensory uh, fascia being a sensory organ, but the fascia is highly innervated. We're talking about the innervation now, but just keep in mind that this is a, this is like we said, a sensory organ with, with, I think it was, was it 500 million was the, was the most recent estimate of how many, how I think many it's a little less was 200 it? something, but yeah, I it, thought it was originally 250 and then they lifted it to 500. Didn't they? Uh, we will have to, we will have to look it up back in the numbers, but Definitely. Oh no. <laughs> Don't even care about the, whatever it's the numbers lot. are. It it's doesn't matter and, that much, the details, but it's our, a lot. Yeah. So it's, yes. it's the, the most richly innervated sensory organ we have. So our fascial tissues have more of those sensory organs than our eyes and even our skin. Those yeah. two have previously been considered to be the richest sensory organ, but no, it's the fascia. Yeah. And I didn't want to segue into that. We've talked about it in the sensory organ episode, but I just wanted to 
place the groundwork so people know exactly why it's so important too. So back to the Ruffini endings, you were, you were talking about Ruffini endings, I think. <laughs> yeah. So I think what we, what we do have to state again, or where we have to do a little recap is um, what those Ruffini endings actually respond to. So we do know that those Ruffini endings um, particularly are interested in, or are responding to slow motions and uh, typically and uh, if you're looking at the video that we're recording it's those slow movements that have th those tangential forces or shear forces so something that we typically are experiencing when we apply myofascial release with rollers or with myofascial release balls so that's something that the Ruffini endings love it's also something that you may experience in any sort of uh, manual therapeutic yeah. setting so and, uh oh and then just a that. quick side note too remember the Ruffini endings and I'm just trying to clarify for people because I know when you first learn this stuff all these words can be confusing but remember the Ruffini endings are a type of mechanoreceptor which um means that they're responsive to mechanical stimulus so anytime I'm applying pressure to the tissues it means I'm potentially influencing those mechanoreceptors and, and in this instance the Ruffini endings. So Ruffini endings are a type of mechanoreceptor which is a type of sensory nerve. So just decoding. Exactly. That was great. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for doing just that. Just going back. We sometimes I'm I'm just, you know, I'm so passionate about this stuff. I'm just diving right in. I know. That's thanks why I'm for here. decoding that one. <laughs> um, yeah. To decode so, the layman's terms. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. those Ruffini endings will respond to those kinds of mechanical inputs. And so let's say you're using your myofascial balls or your foam roller. You are talking essentially, potentially also to your Ruffini endings. And then this will have um, yeah, effects on your proprioception. So your body will know where it is in space and what kind of mechanical input is it, it is experiencing. But, and here comes the, the bookmark that we had set back then and also the, the drum roll worthy <laughs> uh, thing to say today, it also will have or can have an effect on your autonomic nervous system. So potentially after doing foam rolling or after doing myofascial release of any sort, you may also experience that your sympathetic tone is being lowered and your um, vagal tone, so your parasympathetic tone is coming up or is um, activated, especially on the longer term. So it might be a little bit differently immediately in the moment that you are applying the myofascial release technique, but after it or uh, yeah. in the course of things um, that that holds true. And that's sometimes we, we, most of us will have experienced that like after a myofascial release session, there comes that sense of relaxation or that sense of, yeah, very, very deep, deep rest. And that, that might like be related to that. Oh, it's like the, it's the awe moment, you know? And I think everyone who's done MFR, well, hopefully, I, I feel like most people have probably experienced that. I feel like it's hard not to, although I know some people love the like really aggressive MFR, which which might feel a little different because what we're talking about here too is that slow kind of melting pressure rather than that like quick, forceful scribbling. Like sometimes you'll see as yoga teachers, you know, we often see when we're teaching MFR, like the people who just want more and they're digging around and they're searching around. And I'm always reminding people to just find a place that you can have a meaningful conversation with. And, and this is why it's nice when we get some research to support things, because we want to have that, that slow melting pressure to really have a conversation with these Ruffini endings so that we can also have an impact on the nervous system, which I think most people who have, if you've tried that approach and experimented with it, then you feel that. And um, you know, I always recommend for a lot of times it's athletes who love like the big lacrosse balls and they're scribbling all around and trying to get everything. And so, you know, that's often the way I approach it is like, well, let's, let's try this. You know, the idea is that you're going to influence those, you know, the nervous system more and also have that effect and not just the tissue effects. So let's try it, you know, and to each their own, if, if you want to do it the other way, great. But this is a nice support for why we go slower and kind of have more of this listening and melting um, application of the MFR than maybe a more aggressive, you know, forceful, quicker movements, which, you know, maybe we'll find uses for those later on. 
Yeah. <laughs> and I, I have found this bit that you just described to be such a valuable bit of information for athletes and for other people. And, you know, the whole Vegas nerve topic is very popular these days. It even made it to the New York Times now and to many other um, very highly cited uh, sources as well. So many people can can relate to that or are familiar yeah. with that concept. And then really just giving that tidbit of information that what you're doing on the foam roller or on the myofascial release balls is or could potentially be directly related to that gives them or allows them to relax into those slower and maybe not as intense sensations there because that makes sense to people. And I think that's, that's why it's so valuable. And as a yoga teacher, you know, maybe we're teaching MFR classes to help relax, to help with stress management. You know, it doesn't always have to be just about the tissues. I love using it as like a, a downshift, you know, for the body. I know I have some MFR classes on our site, just around really trying to shift the nervous system, but you're going to have that regardless, you know, if you're working, if your goal is tissues or nervous system, you know, you kind of get both luckily together when you apply it in this way. So yeah. That. And it's not only going to be the Ruffini endings that will support that, but also the so-called interstitial receptors. So we do have different types of receptors that um, respond to movement or in uh, impulses such as myofascial release. And as Tiffany already mentioned, you can go back to that episode and the interstitial receptors um, that we have, they will also help with that deep sense of relaxation on different levels. So responding or the those receptors responding can also increase your vagal tone and that can then lead to relaxation on an emotional level but even on a cortical level and even your hormones might change and that might lead to uh, more sense of relaxation or less pain sensitivity and so on so those are also types of receptors that we talk to when we do myofascial release and i feel we're talking about myofascial release now but really any kind of <laughs> yoga movement um, body has work. the potential body work also uh, has the potential for these receptors to respond and therefore has the potential uh, for that link between the tissues and the nervous system. Well, I think that Brie, you, you just said any kind of yoga. Do you think, do you really think any kind of yoga is going to influence both of these receptors in that way? Wouldn't it, are you, are you saying more of like the slow held stuff, like a yin kind of pose or do, do we know? Um, I, I don't know about any specific studies on that, but I would, what I'm referring to in my head at least is um, <laughs> more, more movement oriented stuff that has the potential to, when we talk about the Ruffinis, to create those sheer motions. And I think of vinyasa practice that explores different angles of movements that um, maybe works with those conscious transitions between movement angles that definitely definitely has the potential to evoke um, sheer fo forces and therefore evoke that communication, for instance, with the Ruffinis. Um, but I do think the interstitial receptors, they also have the ability to really register smaller movements and also um, register not only those bigger sheer type um, movements, but smaller changes in angle as well. So potentially... Mm anything that has to do with a little bit of movement might, might be uh, influential there. Yeah. So let's just real quick. I don't want to go in too much depth in this because I want to get back to what we were saying, but just keep in mind, those of you who are listening, that shearing is the movement of the layers past each other. So anytime we're moving, different muscles are moving in slightly different directions because they have slightly different actions. So there's this movement between them that we refer to as this shearing between the layers, between those fascial layers, which is another form of mechanical stimulus too. So a lot of times when we're talking about shearing, what she's mentioning too, is kind of like, I think of this a lot of times like a slow flow, especially with re repetition. Um, but it could also just be in very different angles or movements. Um, and then also these slower movements where there's kind of some balance and stability to stimulate them as well. So a lot of different ways I find the MFR to be the most potent in body work. It's why I shifted a long time ago. I used to love the like you know, go to the massage therapist and get like the really deep, aggressive body work. Cause we all thought that that was better because you were able to get in deeper into the fascia. Um, but I have a very different take for, for the past 
couple of years, I found someone I love and she just like, you know, you find that person that can speak to your nervous system. It doesn't take aggressiveness. Um, anyways, to each their own with massage, with body work, there's a lot more to it that we, you know, we're not going to talk on here, but it's, it's one reason why, um, a more gentle massage, it doesn't have to be totally gentle, but not a deep tissue massage. Um, the, the, the less aggressive forms of massage can be very potent because they speak to the nervous system. And I think there's a potency in finding a body worker who can really have a conversation with your body rather than just, <laughs> you know, like force it, um, to try and do what you want. Cause a lot of times it doesn't work. We know that with humans too. <laughs> if you have children, most, most definitely. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have teenagers. Uh, they for need sure. to be they need to be approached sensitively, definitely. Yeah. And yeah. um as you're talking about body work, many people may have experienced a session or more sessions of osteopathy, which tends to be rather light in touch as well, at least with the people I have experienced it with. And another note on that, what we just discussed is also in osteopathy the the whole abdominal area or our viscera are mm. also targeted and i think one bit of information that's really interesting and we've been pondering on this earlier is that also the ligaments that kind of fix your organs um in, in, in other places, so your visceral ligaments, they also are very rich in those receptors that we talked about, so mechanoreceptors. So when you are being treated in an osteopathy session and your viscera, your abdominal organs, for instance, are being worked on, those mechanoreceptors might also respond and lead to those changes in autonomic nervous system that we just discussed discuss so like the relaxation response and so on and obviously we are also going to target those visceral ligaments with certain movements in our yoga practice because when you do move your abdominal area you will create some sort of pull or push on those um, ligaments and I find that very plausible that also those kinds of movement have the potential to directly influence your nervous system your autonomic nervous sense and system through those mechanoreceptors that we talked about. I love that you mentioned that too, because for me, abdominal massage is something I feel passionately about. I, I've shared in some of our trainings and I definitely have it on some of our classes. It's something I've done personally to myself. I mean, it's usually pretty brief. It's usually right before I go to bed, but when I was in uh, my undergrad, I did a shiatsu training and they also taught us a little bit of what's that called ampuku, which is like a Japanese abdominal massage, which I am a huge fan of. And there's so, and you don't, you don't need to go to a long training. You can just do a little bit of work in there. We know can be really beneficial to look at like the enteric nervous system is huge. And yet we very rarely talk about or touch our abdomen. It's like this foreign place to most of us. Uh, everyone's a little different. I find it's a really important place to dig into, you know, in a, in a yoga practice too, a lot of times like rolling up a blanket and lying on it can be a great way to do that. You can use your fingers and do that. Um, there's a lot more specifics. I know I just one of my friends was having problems with her digestion just yesterday. And I referred her to that practice. I think it's like digestion flow, but there's, um, you know, there's a lot in the gut. And I think just simple things can be so powerful, whether you're finding a body worker, body worker who can do work there, an osteopath or, uh, someone who does a puku or, or abdominal massage of some sort, or doing it to yourself. I'm such a big fan. One of the things I love about yoga is that we can do it to ourselves as someone who, who's, you know, sees patients. I've always wanted to give people things they could do on their own too. And so being able to tap into that, I think is so important with their fingertips or my fascia balls or whatever that might be. This is a potent little area we can tap into or not little area. It's, it's a large central area of the body, right? We can tap yeah. into Yeah. And it doesn't need to be super clean or tidy or technical either. Like what I love to do before my own breath, breath practice is I just, you know, go in with my hands and not even just the fingertips, but I just massage in my abdominal area and just, mm. you know, poke in there friendly, of course, but I, I just massage in there and it's something you can do so easily to yourself. And I 
actually, it's funny that you're saying that. Um, that's been something that's been on my radar so much because I had my second baby a couple months ago. And I it's also when I had my first baby, I already noticed back then when you're pregnant, you're touching your belly area all the time. Like you cannot even help it. You're touching your abdomen all the time and then you're giving birth and then kind of suddenly that stops. And the first time when I had my first kid, that kind of stopped and I, I made it kind of like, I had it on my agenda to actively do that to myself, to actively mm. touch my belly. And this time around, I'm also you know, like consciously making that a practice of its own. And I've been benefiting so much from it, especially in the morning when I do that before I do a little breath practice, I immediately notice how it down regulates me and kind of puts me in that mood for my breath practice. So it's yeah. so simple. It doesn't need to be super technical. It's just that touch and then a little bit of moving around there. I find that so helpful. And there's so much new stuff in our abdomen. I, and I, I don't want to go too far off on a tangent here, but, but think about, I've seen so many people with lower back pain who have rigid abdomens. That's a really big one. Pelvic floor issues, digestive issues, reproductive issues. Like it's such an important area to make sure, obviously we need a good, strong support system here, but we don't want a rigid system. We want to be able to, you know, dig in, like poke around in there. What's, what's tender. Don't overthink it. But like, you know, I think it's a great area to investigate and, um, and mobilize and work with. So, you know, yeah. one other thing before we, as we move on is that with the Ruffini and the interstitial receptors too, before we move all the way past them, um, is that they can also be really helpful. You were, we were talking about local fluid dynamics too. And I think that's just a quick point to note too, unless you wanted to add anything to it, but their ability to help regulate the, the fluid dynamics locally as well. Yeah, definitely. So they can regulate, for instance, blood pressure, and then that has um, an influence generally on the pressure or all the pressures in your system. And that can have an influence on how much local fluid uptake or uh, downshift of fluids you have into the tissues. And that can even sometimes um, help that, that, um, that sense or, or, or um, yeah, sensation that we have, like with trigger point release, for instance, or um, muscle function, like also after we do my fascial release, for instance, that can be related directly to that change in, um, in local fluid dynamics. So that might even have to do with that sense of relaxation as well, that you're just through the autonomic nervous system and the influence on the pressure system do change the, the whole fluid dynamics locally in the tissues. And that includes the viscosity too, right? Yes, exactly. Which is important. I think by my cue in on that, because we talk about that a lot when, when we do MFR work, I think those, those changes in viscosity are a big, important one to notice, to note, just as a side note, but then continuing on, when we look at the, the vagal innervation, I think there's some interesting things as well to point, unless you had something else, feel free to comment. No, on if I'm I think just quick. as you're following <laughs> along this, or as a listener, just to maybe kind of like, as you say, package that what we just discussed. So those were the sensory nerves that we talked about. Those were the sensory nerve endings that also can have an influence on the autonomic nervous system. And now we're kind of moving away from the sensory part of the nervous system to the autonomic nervous nervous system itself. And as part of the peripheral nervous system, the autonomic nervous system has nerves of its own kind of that supply the tissues or that are found in the tissues. And that's what we're kind of moving towards. And there we can distinguish between vagal innervation and sympathetic innervation. So um, yeah, vagal and innervation. And the vagal innervation really being that intimate regulator of the parasympathetic responses too. Yeah, exactly. And I think what's interesting there is to just note that different concepts have found that the vagal innervation is particularly strong or can be found in certain body areas. So to me, just noticing or knowing these body areas is just interesting because you could target your work um, and you could aim towards those areas when you want to specifically talk to that connection that we're discussing today. So one really interesting area is the inner ear. So not your ear canal. So don't poke in there, but like <laughs> that, that um, upper part of the ear. So if you just touch 
the outer part of your ear and kind of massage it or touch it um, that would that would uh, or could potentially address your your vagal response or vagal tone and I know a couple of my colleagues I remember uh, one specifically when she does one-on-one -on -one work and uh, in Shavasana she's massaging the ear a little bit and I think you have to be somewhat intimate with someone um, yeah. or you have to know them really well um, in order to do that but if you're really close or you have those clients that you've been working with forever and they intimately know you and you yeah. do know that they are okay with that that could be something uh, to think to think about or to at least explain maybe why this is uh, quite interesting for some people to experience or not if it's shavasana <laughs> I know for depends, me, the ear depends, massage yeah. is like a relaxation button. It's like instant ear massage yeah. for me. I feel that maybe other people do too. And then, and then there's some, the other areas I think that are really interesting for yoga, the, the back of the tongue and the throat area for me, mm -hmm. those are so interesting as it relates to like bromery as mm -hmm. well as, as well as potentially, you know, the idea traditionally is that that Ujjayi breath is a way to stimulate that vagus nerve by contracting that area where the vagus nerve is. And that's obviously fusing with the traditional practices of modern day understanding. Um, cause we didn't know about the vagus nerve way back when, when these practices were started, but you know, the idea is that with a lot of pranayama, potentially we could be stimulating this, but I think that bromery, especially where we're buzzing or chanting, um, can be a really great way to stimulate that vagus nerve again, which is that primary regulator of the parasympathetic nervous system or, um, parasympathetic tone or vagal tone, whatever you, whatever mm -hmm. way you prefer to phrase it. And I also like what you just said, like the, the humming or the, the chanting potentially also when I came into yoga as a very scientifically oriented athlete, those disciplines or those aspects <laughs> of the practice were always kind of esoteric to me. Yeah. And this, as I said, it, it was quite mind blowing for me to learn about these things and realize that all the things that may have that esoteric touched to me, to me personally, they actually do have a foundation in, in the science as well. So it, yeah. for, for me personally, because my mind is just helps. working that way, it helped me to really relax into those practices and let them, um, let them work me and accept them uh, because I, I had a bit of a, um, hmm, a, a challenge to really welcome them welcome them yeah. into my practice. So for me, that really helped to understand that there is an actual scientific basis, why that works. Um, I work that way. Oh. I know many other people do too. Not all people do need that explanation or that rationale behind it, but for me, it definitely helped. I couldn't agree more. Totally. Yeah. And then, and then the, this ties in the next one. I love the abdomen is the one that really ties back into what we talked about enteric. Like it brings it all, like what you're saying is like, now we get more and more reasons why the abdomen is such a great place to work with. We have vagal nerve innervation, right? We've got all of the, um, the Ruffini and interstitial, uh, endings there. We've got a lot of reasons why working with the abdomen can have a powerful effect on the whole autonomic nervous system, as well as the vagus nerve which is so famous now. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And I think we already covered that a little bit when we discussed yeah. the abdominal work before, but yeah, a, a big one for me also in my own practice and ex in exploring those aspects of the practice. So, so that was all, um, oh, and then the, the diaphragm too. Mm -hmm. The diaphragm mm -hmm. is a big one. And so again, it brings it full circle to the breath work we can do. So that vagal nerve innervation, we've got inner ear, we've got back of tongue, throat, abdomen, diaphragm, all really big interventions with pranayama, the um, abdominal myofascial work that we do. So another great tie-in to a lot of the work that we do in, in yoga, as well as MFR. Um, what else it was, I think we nailed that one. Was there anything else? Yeah. All I right. think we nailed it. <laughs> There's so many places to go. Yeah. <laughs> but so I think it's a good, 
it's a good starting point to have a couple of locations. And obviously what we're talking about is not limited to those locations, but to have a couple of highlights that you could experiment with and to specifically put into your practice or in your teaching and yeah, experiment with it and have that as um, yeah, potential autonomic spots you want to work with and, and yeah, have that, have that knowledge and experiment with it. Love it. So you want to, let's move on to the famous thoracolumbar fascia, because there's been so much research done on this tissue. And if you're not familiar with that, this is the, the fascial tissue that kind of encapsulates a lot of the muscles of the lower back. Um, but without digging specifically into that, just think of this as that fascia right around the lower back. And, um, there's a lot of interesting research here when the, with the ANS too. So I'll let you jump into that mm -hmm. next. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one specific study that's a couple years old, um, we've mentioned or discussed on a couple of episodes here as well. Um, that was done by Siegfried Menze. So he's a German scientist and he looked at the thoracolumbar fascia and looked at the innervation of the thoracolumbar fascia. So again, what kind of nerves run in there? What kind of nerve endings, sensory nerve endings do we have in there? And one thing that they found was that about 40% of all of the innervation in the, in the fascia there were sympathetic fibers. So nerves that were related to the sympathetic nervous system. So remember that one was the fight or flight system. So that um, definitely is related to stress and our stress responses. And that was particularly interesting because many people who do have low back pain um, are reporting that that back pain sometimes gets worse when they are in uh, under a lot of stress, so psychological stress or other. And that makes sense. So if we do know that those fibers that are related to that stress are physically very highly represented in that area, that could be one potential explanation for that increase in pain or back pain when, when you are under a high load of, of stress. So that's really mind blowing as well to have that correlation there of the very high sympathetic fibers in, in that low back area and the thoracolumbar fascia. I think that's and, just a huge one just yeah. to like pause and let it sink in. Cause that, that is another big, there's so many mind blowing pieces of information here. And this was a study from 2019. So it's pretty new and mm -hmm. just how much sympathetic innervation is there is huge because I don't know about you, but other health and other healthcare practitioners who are listening, but it's so common in my practice. I see a lot of low back patients. Um, and it's so common for there to be, for it to be really challenging to diagnose a mechanical issue there. You know, a lot of people with this chronic lower back pain that gets worse with stress or, or maybe, maybe they haven't even made that correlation. It's just undiagnosed, chronic, generalized lower back pain is such a common thing to see in healthcare. It's one of the biggest reasons I think people go. And, you know, sometimes people have disc issues or other things that we can diagnose and put a finger on but I think that that's also a lot less common. So this is a, this is a big finding in, in my perspective as a, in a, as a clinician, um, or as a yoga teacher, it means that we can also have a very impactful effect here by working on these tissues. So yeah, most definitely. And also not only to teachers, but also to the person themselves who is experiencing the back yes. pain, it can be, can be sort of a relief to know that, that you're not imagining that under stress, your back pain is getting worse, but that actually that might be related to the innervation or your nervous system or nerve yeah. supply in that tissue. So sometimes again, having that piece of information can be a relief. And that's uh, what I love about that study as well. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be MFR. There's a lot of great ways to regulate the nervous system, which we're kind of like sprinkling this idea that, 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 also intervening on the nervous system can also have a potential effect on the fascia. It kind of goes both ways. 
And I know there was a, a big study, a Boeing study a, a while back. It's been a while now. They had a big study where they were just looking at correlations with lower back pain. And they found the biggest correlation was job satisfaction, which to me mm -hmm. translates to stress, right? <laughs> like that's the biggest stressor for most people um, because it's, it's not only financial stressor because that's a big thing usually for stress. It's also work stress. It kind of includes the whole bit. Um, so, you know, no matter yeah. which way we look at it, it's a big area to consider. And there's a lot that we yeah, can do. Yeah, and I do. think definitely. And I think that one is really opening a broader topic. I, I do think that one was related then in, in turn to self-efficacy that was related to the workplace too. And I, um, yeah, I, I think that sense of empowerment um, that goes along with that is, is another <laughs> box of worms topic. that we're potentially opening some other time but yeah so so that whole connection but, between emotional and psychological factors and the tissues themselves is really to be explored and I think is so important and goes hand in hand but even though we're not talking about it now I mean like that is a big part of what we do in yoga too we're planting seeds to empower people whether that's through self care or through seeing themselves or the world through a different lens you know it, it's it's all a big part of what we do within a yoga practice so just a little side note <laughs> Definitely. And uh, one more thing that I wanted to mention um, with the low back innervation or thoracolumbar lumbar innervation, um, also as it relates to inflammation. And remember, inflammation can have so many different causes or um, yeah, pathologies behind it. Um, and we don't want to dive into all the details there. But generally, in inflamed tissues, and I found that quite surprising too, um, we find a lower density mm. of sympathetic endings, um, also according to Siegfried Menze. So I would have thought maybe, mm, okay, there's inflammation, inflammation, mm, generally stressful. There might be an increase in number of sympathetic fibers or nerve endings, but no, it's the other way around. But it makes sense. And I think that's worth mentioning here. Sympathetic fibers generally have an effect on your blood vessels. So generally, sympathetic fibers do help with vasoconstriction. So kind of closing off your blood vessels, making them tighter, so to say. And in inflammation, kind of the opposite happens. So yeah. the vessels open up, that's called vasodilation. And that's related to or can be related to the swelling that you can see in inflammation or the edema. So the additional fluid that kind of goes out into the tissues. And we've talked a little bit about um, fluid dynamics. So that's one aspect as well. The sympathetic fibers are lower when the tissue is inflamed. So the vessels um, are not constricted as much. And then that is an explanation why you have that swelling or that increase in edema in the tissues. So that's an interesting finding or something that I had to wrap my head around first uh, when I heard it. Um, and I think well. because we're talking a lot about stress, keep in mind and correct me if I'm wrong, but that this is a local effect in inflamed tissues. So it's not necessarily happening body wide, I'm assuming. Um, it's not a systemic effect. So you could be in a sympathetic state, right. And, and have, uh, still have this inflammation locally and have, you know, some vasodilation and, and changes locally, I'm assuming. Sure thing. I do think I, yeah. uh, don't have any specific different kinds of studies that I'm thinking of right now. So this one was again related to the thoracolumbar um, fascia specifically. So locally, but yeah, so you, you can have local swelling, obviously. So that can be a local effect and you can still be under generally under high sympathetic load. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And then generally also, um, yeah, we've been talking about the low back and I think that area is so interesting to work with. And um, as we just mentioned, such an important area emotionally as well for many people. But there's also a couple of other areas that we know have a high sympathetic influence, um, not only the low back, but we also know that for generally the backside of your body and then also your scalp. 
and also close generally to your T-spine, so to your thoracic spine, at least that's stated in a couple of body concepts. Um, so that might also, again, be interesting spots to, to work with when you think mm. about that type of sympathetic regulation. Yeah. So keep in mind, because they're sympathetically innervated, that means that we can approach those areas as a way to help downregulate or, or regulate sympathetic activity too. So, um, I just wanted to help clarify because we can use the, the vagal innervation to help regulate parasympathetic tone. Um, and so, we can bring it down into that relaxation response, or we can help regulate the sympathetic activity. Is that hopefully that clarifies a little bit for people too, because the scalp, oh my gosh, that's a big one. I don't know about you, but like, I love scalp massages. Maybe I just love all massages. (laughs) Well, definitely you can give a lot of very good recommendations on it. (laughs) I I used to have that, that massage Uh, thingy. I, I, I don't know where it went. I uh, must have gotten lost with one of our moves. <laughs> it was kind of weird, but you you may know that one that kind of like goes over your scalp yeah. with a couple the of tentacles, massager. like this tiny, oh, that's what it's called. Yeah. See, like that little octopus coming over your head. And I, yeah, that's so good. Uh, so good. Yeah. So let's shift gears last and talk about fascial tone because there's also some really interesting, again, really mind-blowing information about how the, the actual tone of the fascia is changing that I think we should kind of head into next if you're ready to transition. Yeah, definitely. So again, we have mentioned Professor Staubesand in the beginning here. And what I'm about to describe is some major contribution by Robert Schleip, who has been on this show and who is kind of Mr. Fascia and nervous system anyway. (laughs) So a lot that we're talking about today is drawing from from his expertise and knowledge anyhow. But specifically what I'm about to describe is like one of his major contributions to the field. And Professor Staubesand, together with other colleagues, they had generally mm, supposed or proposed a strong influence between the fascial tissues and the autonomic nervous system. And they had thought that potentially um, under stress, neurotransmitters such as adrenaline could influence fascial tone. So they did think that those neurotransmitters could make your fascia actively contract. So your fascia does have certain cells, so-called myofibroblasts, and they have some um, potential or availability. Uh, ability to contract actively that does not have to do anything with muscle contraction so the strength of that contraction is going to be way less but it's going to be high enough so that your neuromuscular coordination for instance can be influenced and those scientists had scientists had proposed that stress And the consequent neurotransmitters, such as adrenaline, might have an effect on that contractility so that when you have stress, the adrenaline could make those myofibroblasts contract more. And that could explain some of the tension that people report when they are under stress. So they tried out in an organ bath. So this wasn't wasn't, um, examined in in vivo, in humans uh, that are walking around, but in organ baths, in Petri dishes, they did try those nervous systems on those cells that are um, able to contract on the myofibroblasts, and they did not find any relationship. So yeah, they were frustrated, (laughs) but they didn't. (laughs) Like you have this great hypothesis, and I think uh, that one was one that's really kind of Mm, intuitively (laughs) would make sense you know like it would make a lot of sense that why they did a lot of organ baths and did (laughs) hope to find that connection but they didn't find the connection and then years later a missing link between stress and that contractility of the fascia or tonicity of the fascia was found and that missing link is um, a cytokine and that cytokine is called TGF beta one. So TGF beta. It's always. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) That one. So remember that one, it's transforming growth factor. That's what TGF stands for beta one. 
And we do also know that this one is being released when you are under psycholog psychologic stress, for instance. So it's not adrenaline, but it's a different type of substance that is being released when you are under stress. And in fact, TGF beta one does have an effect on myofibroblasts. So it's another substance that is released with stress and that actively leads to a contraction of the myofibroblasts. So to decode, as you so, so perfectly usually do, you have stress, TGF beta is released, that can make your fascia contract. That's another drum roll or mic drop or whatever you <laughs> want to call it. It's big. So yeah. having that um, connection between psychologic stress or stress in general and um, that contraction in the fascial tissue, that um, tension in the fascial tissue is huge. And that was found by Robert Schleip and colleagues and is just one of the major contributions to the, to the field in general. Yeah, that was a big one because <laughs> mm -hmm. it makes so much sense. And mm -hmm. again, it, it reminds us so we can go directly into the tissues and do myofascial work, which, you know what, like we've talked about on this, on this podcast a few times, like the great thing about MFR work is people love it. You know, like it's the easiest thing to get compliance with, with your patients or students because people enjoy it and they get that instant instant effect on the nervous system, but all the other things that we do in yoga that are influencing the nervous system are also intervening in this cycle that we're talking about here of releasing that TGF beta, which then increases that myofibroblast activity and the contraction of the tissues. So, um, you know, it, it, it's, it gives us a lot of options to intervene. Most definitely. And I mean, we discussed that certain movements, be it a slow flow or other, can have an influence or can speak to that relationship of the fascial tissues and the autonomic nervous system. But yet, like you just said, this finding opens it up even more. Mm -hmm. And also something like yin yoga or yoga nidra or meditation, all of which influence the stress response. Uh, directly also speak to the fascial tissues also. And that's what I seriously, and I'm not kidding. I, I really find that mind blowing. It's what one of the major things that have given me that aha effect and that puzzle piece that suddenly makes the picture so much clearer how mm. what we do really is affecting our whole system. And this relationship that we're talking about today, in my opinion, is one of the most essential ones when we want to understand how any type of movement with or to the body does have an effect on the mind and emotions and the other way around. So to me, this one is really one of the major puzzle pieces. And I cannot... Um, stress that enough, I would say. So that one is really big as well. And as you said, opens up the possibilities of what we bring into the practice and what kind of aspects of the practice make sense in that context um, so much. Yeah, absolutely. And then I, I think you pulled this out too, which, which is a really interesting one. I hadn't seen this one, but um, you had this on our list <laughs> for the episode. It was a pa the paper in 2021. Do you want to mention that? I think that is pretty amazing too. The pH one, um, the, the depression one. Ah, the depression one. Yeah, sure. Don't skip so the depression paper. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, we don't want that. A very, very new one that yes. looked at, um, depression disorder and looked at fascial stiff. So that's basically one um, outcome or one variable that's related to that fascial tonicity, like how tense is your fascia, how stiff is your fascia. And they did find that in a major depressive disorder, the fascial tissues are in fact more stiff. So that relationship is also kind of like a starting point or a kickoff yeah. point to explore further. But we can actually, what we just described, that increase in tonicity in the fascial tissues that has now been linked to uh, psychologic disorders as well. So it's something that we may have hypothesized before, and it's definitely something that many of us intuitively would agree with, but that's 
like one of its kind of first one. Um, and Robert Schleip has been involved in that one as well. And I think, as I said, it's a good starting point, a, a much needed starting point that explains that the fascial tissues are related to those um, psychological disorders. I just love that. Level. And obviously it's just a correlation. There's more to be done, but it's also very new. And I just think for me, I love using MFR for so many reasons and that go so far beyond the physical or even the physiological, but also to that mental state. Um, I just think it's very potent for anxiety and depression and, you know, and things like eating disorders. And I think there's, there's so much there in the psychological realm that we can use, you know, one, I always just assumed it was partly just self-soothing, you know, but now we see, and we have more to learn, of course, but now we see some of these scientific connections, which give us something to work with. And then you can experiment. Obviously it's not a cure for depression or a cure for any of these things. There's more to the story. We're very three-dimensional beings. There's a lot to us, <laughs> but it could be, it could be the one big thing, or it could be one of several things that help, um, shift for ourselves or our patients or our students. If you're a yoga teacher, um, so just a good side note, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And then the pH. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Lastly, I mean, last but not least. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and you just said, I mean, we're, we're very complex three-dimensional beings and there are other aspects coming into this as well. One of them being um, your pH levels. And there's also much to, to be understood about pH levels, um, be it how they are created locally or systemically. And that's another story. But um, we also know that lower pH levels, so an acidic environment, can also make those myofibroblasts contract to some degree. So that's uh, very interesting to people who are fascinated by pH values, and there's many of them out there as well. And uh, knowing that this acidic environment can also um, yeah, make the myofibroblasts contract is also very interesting. And of course, we do know this uh, from wound healing, um, there's an acidic environment as well. And it's important that the tissues kind of contract to close off the wound. So that's kind of like, I think that was the starting point of that type of research, but it's an interesting finding. Um, and hopefully we will learn more about that whole concept or context in the future too. Well, and the first thing that comes to my mind too, there is like our ability to influence pH through breath work. You know, we know that the exhalation is associated with a more alkalinizing effect as we, as we <laughs> offload carbonic acid. And so, um, just a lengthening exhalation potentially. And we also know that there's a great effect on the stress response. So it kind of comes full circle. Some of these really simple and, and, you know, maybe there's another episode at some point on pranayama or breath work that we could do, but you know, just a, a simple extended exhalation can be a great way to facilitate and support this. And also the stress response um, for many people, just lengthening their exhalation, I think can be a very quick way to shift that stress state and how they feel. Um, obviously there's more to breath work than that, but <laughs> just a little note. So there's, I mean, there's a lot of great information in this episode. And, and I agree so much of it is so mind blowing and such a shift from what we used to know, even, even five years ago or 10 years ago, things have changed um, so much. Obviously we know that the fascia is highly innervated. That was the starting point, which gives us the sensory organ to make these changes. And then starting to look at how the work on the fascia, especially myofascial release and body work, but also these, these mindful movement therapies, um, can have a really important influence on that autonomic nervous system through the sympathetic nervous system, through the mechanoreceptors, mechano as well as through those neuroendocrine changes we talked about. So those were kind of the three main ways that it's influencing it. Um, and then our ability to work on the autonomic nervous system, meditation, yin, restorative, pranayama, so many great things we do in yoga can have such a significant influence on the fascia because of that, especially things like the thoracolumbar fascia in the lower back. <laughs> like what if we take that and apply it to these regions we know are so potent, the scalp, um, the abdomen, right? We've got all these different areas that we can work on. I mean, even the ear, I actually stimulate that with MFR when I work on, I do it with a foam roller right here on the temporalis, which is a muscle right above the ear, which is right from the jaw. 
and you can kind of grab the top of the ear, which is a really nice way to calm that. So there's a lot of ways that we can intervene here as, as yoga teachers or yoga practitioners um, or healthcare providers. There's a lot of ways to influence it. We know that the thoracolumbar fascia is a really potent source that we can tap into, which could explain a lot of generalized, nonspecific, more chronic lower back pain. We also have um, thoughts here. It's planting seeds for potential support for depression. But we know that also the fascia can contract even in response to that sympathetic nervous system, um, as well as our interventions can influence that contraction. So a lot of that's around the myofibroblasts and TGF beta, as well as um, pH can influence that. So there's a lot of great intervention points. We've talked about, um, we talked about the vagal, vagal vagus inter, uh, innervation as well. But I think there's a lot of interventions here from Bromery for that vagal stimulation and the ear and the scalp, as well as abdominal work, pretty much all pranayama, MFR work, really anywhere. So there's so much, there's so much we can do to influence this tissue to reg by regulating stress or through body work or pranayama or yoga, um, or nervous system regulation. And another reason why MFR can be so valuable and all these things. So that, that was your summary of takeaways, but there was so much more, uh, anything you want to add there, Katya? Just as a, a much more general takeaway or, or summary of that, I think this is one of the episodes that make it irrevocably clear that our body and mind are not two separate things. And it doesn't even make sense to call them those separate entities, maybe. Mm. It's really one. And uh, that's like the general notion that we have in yoga, but it, it's really breaking it down that way and discussing those interconnections to me make that so clear that it's not one or the other but it is everything is connected and that might uh, be something that has been said so many times but here it really comes to life for me I love that was so well said and and I also just want to add the note of you know, like we always think of stress as bad and we're not necessarily saying that, you know, the stress is a bad thing. It's just that we want stress in the right time and the right amount. We want it to be able to ebb and flow. And I think these practices give us so much tools and empowerment to help self-regulate and adjust that when those get, you know, kind of shift out of balance and that, you know, stress is still a good thing in the right time and the right place but that we have all these really impactful, efficient, and potent resources built into our body. That is the crazy thing. Like we are built to be able to take care of ourselves. And that's what I love about yoga is that it doesn't need a lot of fancy tools or expensive gadgets or anything other than just learning. And I love that we can offer this podcast so that you can keep learning and, and, and finding these resources in your body. It's always been very important to me as a healthcare provider, as a yoga teacher, as a yoga teacher trainer, to be able to give people resources so that they can do the work on their own, because it's the work that we do regularly that really has an impact long-term on our body, our body mind. We'll call it, we'll pull that as one word. I love that. Our body mind continuum. I love that. Um, to really make an impactful difference, you know, ongoing in our lives, not just right now. So hopefully this has provided some more resources for you and information to share with you and your students or friends or patients, if you're a healthcare provider, um, and if you like it, share it, get the word out, because I think more and more people need to know about this. It's, it's getting spread around, but the more we can spread it, the better, um, because it is just, I think, such powerful information. So thank you all for listening. I look forward to having you again for more fun conversations. Thank you, Katya. Looking forward to all that is to come as well. <laughs>
You can find more information, articles, trainings, and classes at yogamedicine.com or check us out on social media as Yoga Medicine. You can also email us at info at yogamedicine.com. Thank you for being a part of our Yoga Medicine community. We look forward to seeing you again. The content of this podcast is not medical advice and is not meant to replace medical care. Please consult your healthcare provider to determine what is best for your unique healthcare needs.